Would you please join me once more as we go to the Lord in prayer, asking his blessing on the sermon this morning and uh, that he would be glorified through it. Father, you are all wise. You are all knowing and you are completely good. Lord, we are none of these things. I am none of these things. And so, Lord, I pray that you would guide the words of my mouth this morning, that they would reflect your truth, protect me from error, and, Lord, be at work in all of our hearts to conform us to the image of Christ through the word that you have given to us. We thank you so much for your faithfulness to do this week in and week out for a lifetime. We just commit our time to you now, praying that it would indeed be honoring to you and be transformative for us. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Expectation versus reality. Expectation and reality. Sometimes they're the same. Many times they're not the same. When was the last time that your reality, your experience did not meet your expectations? Was it a good thing? Or was it not a good thing? Expectations can often go off center from reality in relationships. Plenty of experience in talking with young people who are in the first year or two of marriage. Thinking, this is not what I thought it would be. Which then causes me to reflect on my own expectation of marriage. Not just of how marriage would be, but how I would be as a husband. And how that reality did not live up. My reality did not live up to my expectations of my own performance. Expectations of a job. Maybe not quite what you were promised or not quite what you anticipated it being. And again, this may be for the better or not. Expectations in health. Expectations in the weather. We had a work day yesterday and I don't know whether it, sometimes with things like work days, it's, it's the default setting is to expect it to rain. <laughs> In which case, your expectations were met. But we never know what is going to be thrown at us on any given week, and we have our expectations. We live as though that those expectations will pan out, and then most of the time we need to adjust when they don't line up exactly right. Jesus was making his way in the lead-up to the text this morning into Jerusalem. He had been heading towards Jerusalem steadily for some time. And it was from the Gospel of John that we know it wasn't long before he entered Jerusalem that he was in the nearby village of Bethany where he was raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. And then sometime not too long after that, he went and had a dinner, a banquet with Lazarus and Mary and Martha and others. And news traveled quickly as a result of Lazarus being raised from the dead. There were many who were there to see it, and those who were not there to see it certainly heard about it. And so, as word spreads quickly, people begin to believe more and more in Jesus. And so the chief priests, John tells us, began to plot how to put Jesus to death, but not just Jesus, how to put Lazarus also to death. And so it's with that backdrop of increasing belief or attention towards Jesus among the Jewish people and the rising animosity and opposition from the Jewish religious ruling class looking to put him to death. It's against that backdrop that Jesus has dinner in Bethany one night and then the next day begins making his way just a few miles down the road to head to the city of Jerusalem. And many who were in Jerusalem because he's heading there for the Passover, 
celebration. So there are many Jews from all around who have traveled far to come to the city as they're commanded for this celebration, for this holiday observance. And so the crowds that have been coming, it, the, the population is swelling. And many who have already begun to pay attention closer to Jesus because of the issue with Lazarus, because of this event, now they are following his every move and they see that he's getting ready to travel to Jerusalem and so they're going with him. So John presents this picture that there are many accompanying him even as he begins this journey before the account that Matthew picks up for us in the passage that Pastor Ron read earlier this morning. And again, if you're not there right now, I'd encourage you to turn to Matthew 21 which Pastor Ron said, that's on page 826 in the Pew Bible. But Matthew 21, the first 11 verses, is Matthew's account of Jesus' travel from this outside town into the city of Jerusalem and the crowd and the reaction of the crowd that is accompanying him. So as I said, we know from John, he's already accompanied by this crowd. Let me just set the stage. You've already heard the text read, so I won't read it again, but I want to just sort of bring a, a little color to this into, into your imagination, that there's a crowd following and Jesus turns to two of his disciples and sends them into this nearby town and tells them that they are to go and look for a donkey, that they'll find one. He tells them where to look for it, where they'll find it. He tells them what to say if they're challenged on bringing it to him and then to bring it to him so that he can ride it into the city. And from other accounts in Luke and Mark, we know that the owners did see these two disciples coming and taking this donkey, and they do question them. And the disciples say what they're told to say. The Lord has need of them. And so they say this, and the, the owners send them on their way with the donkey, and as Matthew points out, this donkey and her colt. And so this situation starts to take shape, and, and things start to speed up. The Disciples pile some cloaks on the donkey, and Jesus gets onto the back of this donkey that has never been, a young donkey that's never before been ridden. With crowds following after him, with crowds going before him, he's making his way into the city, and along the way, those who had come to meet him and others who see this rolling crowd, this growing crowd coming and getting louder and louder, they begin to take down palm branches from the trees, and they lay them in front of the donkey. Some of them take their own cloaks and lay them down in front of the donkey, making sort of a red carpet for Jesus to travel on as he heads towards the city. And then as it continues to pick up steam, voices are lifted up and the crowd begins to cry out things like, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you can imagine the spectacle, the spectacle of this giant procession, unplanned and unexpected procession, that in a city that's already crowded, already swelling with people, streets that are already packed, here comes this large procession, hundreds, perhaps thousands of people streaming down from the Mount of Olives into the city. And at the center of it all, a man riding on a donkey who's being hailed, who's being lauded, and whose way is being paved by palm branches and cloaks that are weighted with symbolism for the Jewish people. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But you can imagine the spectacle, you can imagine the pomp that seems to be there, and maybe even the confusion for those who don't expect to see this, maybe don't even know who this Jesus is. And by the time that Jesus enters the city, Matthew reports at the close of this that there are those who are already in the city who are left asking, who could this man possibly be? And it's at that point that we reach a major point of interest in the passage. A question arises from within this passage. That question, who is this man? Who is this man who's coming in in such a spectacle? Who is this man whom the crowds are crying out for and treating in such a way? Because there's a stark contrast. The question is important because there's a stark contrast between the crowd's treatment of Jesus and how he is presenting himself. By their behavior, 
the crowd seems to be expecting and welcoming a liberator. They're throwing down their cloaks. That has biblical precedent of welcoming a new king. Palm branches littering the street, which again has biblical significance in the Feast of Tabernacles where in part it's a celebration of the new harvest, but in part it's also, we're told in Leviticus, to be a reflection on how Israel traveled out of Egypt. So Israel's great slavery in Egypt and now how they have been released from this bondage, released from slavery to a greater power and set on their way by the greatest power that their God would send them into the wilderness and they would construct these little temporary dwelling places and the, the feast of tabernacles or the feast of booths is there to commemorate, to draw their minds back to how God liberated them from another nation and so the palm becomes very symbolic of that celebration. But it's also very symbolic for another reason. When Judas Maccabee led the people of Israel, led the Jewish nation to revolt against the Seleucid Empire two centuries before, he goes in to cleanse the temple. He goes in to liberate the city. And on his way into the city, the Jews are cutting down palm branches and laying them before him. So there is a biblical significance laden in this. There is a historical significance, a national significance for the people of Israel in seeing these palm branches laid down before someone who comes riding into the city. And as people cry out, Hosanna, these cheers, they're laden with meaning for a messianic liberator. The word Hosanna and the phrase blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord are taken from Psalm 118. Pastor Ron mentioned that Matthew links this to Zechariah's prophecy in chapter 9 of, of his book. But in Psalm 118 verses 25 and 26 we read this, Save us we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. So that word, Hosanna, meaning God save us or save now, was originally a prayer. It was originally a prayer for God to literally, quite literally, save his people. But it seems to have morphed over time, as these things do, into a phrase, a cry of praise, a hail. In this case, used to hail Jesus as he enters the city. But in this way, it's not perhaps not too different from some phrases that we use in our own nation, in our own culture. God bless America started out as a very real, very literal prayer for God to save and bless a fledgling nation. And about a century later, it became part of a well-known and very popular anthem. And roughly a century after that, it's now commonly found all over the place between bumper stickers and at the end of presidential speeches and addresses, it can still be a prayer. But it has also taken on additional meaning, additional weight. And so that's likely what's going on here when they're crying out, Hosanna, save, God save, or Hosanna to the son of David, they're probably crying out a hail to their expected liberator. They're looking at this one way, but Jesus is looking at it in a different way. He's not, he's not rejecting their cry for him as king, as liberator, but it's in a different way. It's unknown to the crowd, mostly. Perhaps there was some in the crowd who saw the, the significance of Zechariah the way Matthew presents it. But Jesus is doing this deliberately to fulfill prophecy. Before he even begins this entry into the city, he goes and tells the disciples to go fetch this, this young donkey. And he's doing that for this particular reason. So turn with me to Zechariah chapter 9, page 797 if you're using the Pew Bible. If you're not using the Pew Bible, it's one of the last, it's the next to the last book in the Old Testament. 
So it's easy to find that way. Go from Matthew back to Malachi and then back a little further to Zechariah chapter 9. In Zechariah chapter 9, this king is prophesied. But it's a king who's going to act in a very particular way. Verse 9 of Zechariah 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He goes on to say, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The prophecy, the word that the Lord is giving here is that he will send a king. He will send salvation, rescue to the people of Israel. And he will send it through this king, but this king comes in in humility riding on the back of a donkey with the chariot and the war horse and the bow of war being cut off, this king comes in and speaks peace to the nations. The Jews of the day are weary under the thumb of Rome. They're weary from the hand of Herod, from the taxation and the oppression and the restrictions that they live under. Now, yes, it could have been worse than they had it in Rome, but it could have been far better. And the people of Israel yearned for the day where their nation would be restored to them, where the king long promised would come and restore the kingdom to them. And so when people see Jesus coming, set aside for a moment what Jesus has said of his own ministry. Set aside his own mode of transportation for the day. When people see a large crowd gathering, casting down cloaks and palm branches before an individual riding into the city and crying out to him, Hosanna, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord or who has been sent by the Lord, there's a strong nationalistic fervor that's probably sweeping up, rising in the hearts of these Israelites, as these Jews, as they welcome the the man that they expect to be their liberator. There's a great gulf of difference between their expectation and reality. The tension of what Jesus is about to do and what the crowd saw. Because again, Jesus, deliberately looking to fulfill this prophecy from Zechariah, obtains this donkey and rides in. In his teaching, he proclaims often the gospel of the kingdom. But he doesn't speak about casting down Rome. He speaks about salvation, but he doesn't speak about national salvation. There's a great tension between the majesty of this procession and the meekness of the one that's at the heart of it. That song that we sung this morning captures that dual nature of this procession. Ride on, ride on in majesty, in lowly pomp, ride on to die. That's not the message of a great liberating, conquering king that the people of Israel were expecting. But it is a good message. There's a sobriety to this scene, to that hymn, that's not commonly found in our worship today. We tend to, for various reasons, but we tend to shy away from somberness as part of our worship, corporately, privately. We gravitate, and it's not a bad thing, but we gravitate towards joy and celebration. When you read a scene like this, imagine just for a moment 
What are the emotions in play for Jesus as he rides towards the city? The emotions of his disciples who have been following him for years. You may remember from John chapter 11, when Jesus makes the decision to go to Lazarus, Lazarus has died, and Jesus says, friends, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and we will go to him, that that I may wake him. And the disciples try and talk him out of it, because they know going to Bethany means practically going to Jerusalem, where the Jews are already seeking to kill him. They're going to seek to kill him far more after Lazarus is raised from the dead, But Thomas says, let us go with Jesus that we may die with him. Jesus has been telling his close followers that he goes to die. That he goes towards crucifixion. So what? put yourself in the place of one of his close followers. What is in your heart as you see crowds hailing Jesus? celebrating his arrival, getting very worked up and excited, and you yourself not knowing fully what to expect. Remember, when Jesus, in the beginning of Acts, when the disciples see Jesus again, they say, Jesus, will you now restore the kingdom? Even then, they didn't fully get it, so they don't know entirely what to think. But this swell, this mixture of emotions is there, but there is a somberness to Jesus' procession that even as he's being hailed as a great king, And he is a great king. This crowd is about to be vastly disappointed. They shouldn't have been. But they were. Because their expectations did not match reality. There's often, in this case, for them, there was a great gulf between the king that they thought they wanted and the king they received. We need to be careful for ourselves. Is there a gulf between the king that we think we want and the king who is? For the assembled crowd, there was the king that they desired, the one that they thought they had in Jesus, despite all this evidence to the contrary, despite the things that Jesus has proclaimed about his own ministry, despite the way that he comes bringing peace, despite the way that he chooses to enter the city in humility, And in lowliness, there is great misunderstanding and great confusion. Because yes, they have what they believe to be their liberator, but then the king who is comes in humility. The king who came not to be served the way a king would, but to serve. Not to overthrow the power of Rome, but to give his life as a ransom for many and so overthrow the power of sin. This is what Jesus came to do. This is why Jesus came not to conquer, but to die. And again, to point you back to that, it's not scripture, but to point you back to that verse in that that hymn that we sang. O Christ, your triumphs now begin over captive death, and conquered sin. Jesus Christ did not overthrow the Roman Empire that day, though his church would go on to survive the Roman Empire. His church would go on as he tells his followers, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of this Christ, of this Messiah, this King. The question that hangs in the air is this. If the crowd knew that Jesus was going to die six days later, he'd be in the ground. If they knew he was going to die, would they have cheered him? Would they have hailed him? Would they have taken their cloaks and thrown them down on the street to be trampled on? Would they have gathered palm branches in national excitement, to welcome this coming Messiah, this coming King? Would they have cheered him? They welcomed the arrival of the Messiah, but they did so on their own terms. I wonder, how do you respond to Jesus today? It's one thing to welcome the Jesus who says, your sins are forgiven. It's another 
to embrace the Jesus who says, go and sin no more. I remember it wasn't too many years ago that I taught back-to-back lessons on those two stories. The story of the paralytic who's lowered down from the ceiling. And on seeing his face, Jesus says, friend, your sins are forgiven. And then heals him. And then the man born blind, who Jesus heals. And the man says, I don't know who healed me. All I know is that I was blind and now I see. And when Jesus goes and later finds him in the temple, he says to him, your faith has made you well. Now go and sin no more. Two weeks, two lessons, one Jesus. The reaction to some, not all, but the reaction uniformly the first week was very welcoming. It's it's an upbeat message. Your sins are forgiven. That's a good, upbeat message. But to largely the same group when I taught the second lesson the following week, go and sin no more, it was interesting to see the response. There were some who had a very similar response. But there were others who had looks on their faces that surprised me. You would have thought that I just opened up my mouth and vomited all over the floor. There was maybe disgust is too strong a word, but there was an off-putness. Wait, who... Who would tell me that? Go and sin no more. Mind your own business. But they come out of the mouth of the same Savior, one statement and then the other. It's ironic when you look at this passage and you see what the Jews were expecting and what they received and the the disconnect between those two things. The Jews of Jesus' day, they ultimately rejected him once they saw that their expectation of a conqueror was replaced with a humble servant whose mission was to die. But today, we embrace that Savior. We embrace the meekness and self-sacrificial nature of Jesus. We embrace that aspect of Jesus. But how many are uncomfortable? How many who embrace the humble, meek, Dying for others, Jesus, but recoil at the Jesus of Revelation. Because this triumphal entry, as it's called, is a foreshadowing of Jesus' second coming. In his first coming, he comes to earth and he travels to Jerusalem to die, to conquer sin. But he's pictured in Revelation. The Jesus of Revelation comes with a sword. Robes that are dipped in blood. He comes that time not to die, but to conquer and to judge. So I ask again, I wonder, how do you respond to Jesus? Because that question is so very important. You and I do not have the luxury of dictating the terms to which God may save us. We do not have the luxury or the position to dictate how God should rule over us. And yet that is often how we would wish to approach a relationship with Jesus. I'll take all the things that I want, all the things that appeal to me, all the things that appeal to my sensibilities in the way that I think they ought to be done, I'll happily embrace those and I'll pay less attention to the things that make me uncomfortable. The things that I don't want. The things I wish Jesus wouldn't say. The way God behaves that I wish he wouldn't. That maybe I find embarrassing by today's Standards. That's one of the problems we face today. That we look at things, we look at the culture. We are, you and I are immersed in culture we cannot help but be. That's true of every human in every generation in all of human history. We are shaped indelibly by the way that our culture thinks. 
And this isn't a church good, culture bad kind of statement. This is simply a reality, an acknowledgement of the reality that you and I are shaped by the forces around us more than we recognize. And so that consumeristic approach, I will tell you without any pride, but also without any hesitation that I feel that consumeristic approach to scripture myself. Are there things that I wish would be different? Sure. But you know what? Here's what I can say for sure. And here's what anchors me to this book. That there is a God who is far wiser than I am. There is a creator who knows the end from the beginning. In a way that I do not. We'll talk in two weeks when we return to Colossians about this idea a little bit more. But for now, we do well to remind ourselves that when it comes to God, when it comes to his person, when it comes to his works, when it comes to his gifts, when it comes to how he chooses to operate in the world that he has created, what we want, what you want, what I want is always inferior to what he presents. Did you have a lousy day in your life this week? A day that would have resulted in your comfort and happiness would not have been better than the day of difficulty, frustration, or even tears. And time and again, the Lord shows his goodness to us, not in the happiness, but in the pain and the difficulty. If Jesus had come to liberate national Israel from Rome, that would have been a good thing with benefits to be sure, but it pales in comparison. Not worth holding a candle to the reality of what Jesus was going to do. I don't want to imagine a world where Jesus rides in, frees national Israel from the yoke of Rome, and leaves me under the yoke of sin. And so I ask again, how do you respond to Jesus this morning? God's good purposes always trump, always surpass our desires. So do you follow the Jesus that you want? Do you follow the Jesus that you design? Or do you follow the Jesus who is? Our Father, this is a weighty thing. That every one of us is imperfect in our thoughts imperfect in our knowledge, imperfect in our wisdom, imperfect, flawed in our desires. But you are flawless. You alone are perfect in wisdom. You alone are worthy of all glory, but even all obedience. So Lord, when we come to a day like this, Palm Sunday, we reflect on all that Jesus had set before him and the path that he joyfully walked. in order to bring honor to the Father and salvation to the lost. Lord, would you fill us with certainty that we follow this Jesus wherever he leads. We serve him whatever the cost and that we worship him whatever our lesser desires might be, that we would lay all at the feet of so great a Savior, so great a King. Lord, we pray that you would be at work powerfully in our hearts this week as in the lead up to Good Friday, in the lead up to Easter, Resurrection Sunday. Lord, would you just fill our hearts with gratitude, 
with joy and with unwavering devotion to you as we consider the life that you have laid before us this week. We pray it all in great hope in the name of our risen and reigning and we pray soon returning King, Jesus Christ.